So I'm Howard Goldman. I'm a urologist who specializes in female pel pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery in the Department of Urology at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm here at FUSE, and we just had a lecture on recurrent UTIs. So we'll just spend a few minutes uh, talking about some basic points. So while 50% of women will have a UTI at one point or another in their life, about 2.8% of women will ultimately have recurrent UTIs. And a recurrent UTI is defined as a UTI, you had one, it was completely resolved, and then you have a second one. And the strict definition is if you have two UTIs within six months or three UTIs within a year, then that puts you in the category of what we call recurrent UTIs. Now there are a number of things that can make it more likely that someone has recurrent UTIs. Chief among this is after menopause, if somebody has atrophic vaginitis, that is a risk factor for recurrent UTIs. A number of other things, um, including patients who um, use spermicides, because that can interrupt the normal bacteria that provide a barrier uh, to uh, pathogenic bacteria getting into the vagina and bladder. Um, other things, including frequent antibiotic use for other purposes, that can also interfere with the normal flora. Um, if somebody has some kind of anatomic or functional abnormality of the bladder or the lower urinary tract, such that they're not emptying their bladder well or they have any degree of obstruction, that can put them at risk for recurrent UTIs. If you think about it, the female urethra is relatively short and the female vagina normally has plenty of bacteria in it. So bacteria are ascending from the vagina to the bladder all the time. And one of the defense mechanisms is when you void normally and you get rid of most of the urine, so you wash out the bacteria. However, if somebody is not emptying well or has some kind of other abnormality in the lower urinary tract, um, then they may not be able to wash out all of that bacteria. They may then sort of have the opportunity for that bacteria to fester in the bladder, so to speak, and divide and ultimately end up with a UTI. There are another of a number of other risk factors. So there are some genetic risk factors, such that if a first-degree female relative has had frequent UTIs, then their female relatives have a higher chance of developing these. And the thought there is that there are actually different types of receptors in the water wall uh, that may make it more likely for bacteria to stick to and therefore um, replicate and, and multiply in the bladder, and that may be, have a genetic basis. So as far as the diagnosis, it's pretty straightforward. If you've had two UTIs, in six months or three in a year, and remember, the initial UTI should have been fully treated, patient is symptom free, and then they get another UTI for it to be really a, a new UTI and to count towards recurrence. Uh, most of these patients actually do not need any sort of imaging or cystoscopy. Uh, occasionally, if someone really is having, when we define how you treat these, but if someone is continuing to have breakthrough infections or if someone has problems emptying or you think there may be some lower urinary tract dysfunction, or in specific other cases, there might be a reason to do cystoscopy or urodynamics. You know, for instance, if someone had a uh, synthetic sling a year or two prior and you're concerned there might be something in the bladder that could be a nidus for infection, that would be a cause for cystoscopy. As far as some of the preventative measures, so there are a few areas where there's good data that says that things actually can help uh, prevent recurrent UTIs. Chief among that is vaginal hormonal uh, replacement. There's good data that shows that in women who have atrophic vaginitis and postmenopausal women who use, whether it's hormonal cream or some other uh, sort of uh, application of uh, vaginal hormones, that that decreases the risk of recurrent UTIs. So some other things that can actually help uh, prevent or limit recurrent UTIs, if somebody is using spermicides as part of their contraceptive planning, so stopping that and utilizing something else can help prevent uh, recurrent UTIs. And as we alluded to earlier, uh, frequent antibiotic use can actually lead to recurrent UTIs. So sort of limiting other types of antibiotic use can be helpful. Uh, D-mannose is a sugar that actually has shares common receptors that E. coli bind to. So there are receptors in the bladder that are actually called mannose receptors. And those are the receptors that bacteria bind to and then are allowed to stick in the bladder and multiply. So if you actually put d mannose in the bladder, it sort of interferes with that, and the, bac the bacteria will bind to the d mannose and then get excreted out. 
Uh, so there are some D mannose preparations that people take orally, and there is some a little bit of evidence showing that that might help. I think that's an area for future research, and hopefully in the future we'll actually have better bioavailability of mannose in the bladder, and that might be helpful. Some of the common things that people frequently talk about, including probiotics, cranberry products, uh, methanamine, very, very soft data that that is helpful in uh, reducing the rate of recurrent UTIs. Uh, there are some mixed studies, but for every good study, there's a negative study. And again, most of these things are not harmful, and if a patient feels that they think it helps them, I'm really not opposed to it. Now, if a patient continues to get recurrent UTIs, there are a number of treatment strategies, and there are three primary ones. One is either nightly prophylaxis with a very low-dose antibiotic, one is antibiotic use at the time of sexual activity, and one is um, self-start therapy. So if a patient notes that there's a clear relationship between sexual activity and development of a UTI, we'll frequently have them just take a very low-dose mild antibiotic, either right before or right after sexual activity. In a patient who doesn't have that kind of association but is just getting random UTIs, if they get two or three or four a year, what I will do is I will give them a standing prescription, something like natriferantoin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, uh, and they could keep that in their home, and as soon as they get the symptoms of UTI, go ahead and take that and sort of nip it in the bud. There have been a lot of studies showing that women who've had UTIs, they know when they have them. Um, they don't necessarily have to come and drop off a urine or anything like that. And so if somebody gets three or four infections a year, I think self-start treatment where they've got that standing prescription can be very helpful. On the other hand, somebody who gets six, seven, eight infections a year, that would be a lot of multiple treatments. So what we'll frequently do in those cases is actually put them on a very low dose antibiotic just to take every night before they go to bed. Um, and that can be effective for some patients. We usually, after three to six months, try stopping that. And when we stop it, about half the patients will start to get infections again and may need to go back to it. Now, again, one very important thing that we mentioned earlier is the use of hormone replacement therapy for those with uh, the postmenopausal women with atrophic vaginitis who are getting UTIs. And that's sort of a given, so that in any of the other categories of how to treat these things that I just spoke about, if they are postmenopausal and having and have atrophic vaginitis, um, unless there's some contraindication, we are going to give them vaginal hormonal replacement uh, treatments in addition to the other medical treatments that we've given them.